go ahead and get started. Tonight is a prophecy update night. Uh, every year before the, the New Year's, we like to have a time of just reflecting, getting back into the Word uh, prophetically and finding out what the signs of the times are, what the Bible says will be going on in the times leading up and before the Lord returns. And so it's always an interesting time. You know, uh, we can make this into one of those doom and gloom kind of things, and I hope you don't come across, or I hope I don't come across with that kind of doom and gloom kind of ideas tonight. I have some subjects that are a little bit scary, and and I hope, uh, you know, we've got some little kids in here tonight, and uh, the youth group's here with us, and and so I'm not trying to scare anyone. I, I hope you guys feel that uh, I'm just trying to give you some information to be thinking about in light of the uh, end times and that that sort of thing, because really it should be a joyous time, Uh, even though the the subjects can be fairly uh, scary, uh, downright uneasy to talk about uh, if they're actually going to come true. You know, man, these are some pretty heavy things. Um, But it really should be a a reflection in our own hearts that, man, the Lord is coming back. I can't wait to be with Him. I can't wait to just get on with eternity with the Lord and uh, get past this stage of of human existence and and just go into eternity with the Lord. And so we're all looking forward to that, of course. And so we want to keep it in that context um, here tonight. All right. Well, let's go ahead and begin. I want you to open up your Bibles and turn to Luke chapter 21 verse 24 through 28 is what we're going to look at tonight of course this section of of luke is is the olivet discourse uh more popular or well well known i guess you might say over in matthew the uh, book of matthew chapter 24 is that olivet discourse where jesus really lays out uh, a really full spectrum of what's going to happen during the tribulation period and again, this is a period that is a, a trial and a tribulation and a time of trouble for the Jewish people, for the Jews who will be here after the rapture of the church. But what we find in these verses are, you know, things that are going to start happening leading up until that time of great tribulation, that time of great peril for the Jewish people. And so, you know, in the uh, pre-tribulation um, way of of prophecy that that most of us believe in you know that the rapture is going to happen before that seven-year tribulation period uh, where the Christians are taken out of the world uh, and then the Jews and all the rest of the folks are left behind here uh, to deal with with these things that are going on during that tribulation period well in Luke there are a couple of things in here that really kind of jumped out at me, things that we don't really talk about a whole lot when we're dealing with Bible prophecy. And so I wanted to take a look at them a little bit. Uh, and let's just go, kind of read through the, the five verses there together. In verse 24, it says, And they, talking about the Jews living there in Jerusalem, this is right after the uh, abomination of desolation period has happened there in the temple where the Antichrist has set up his image and all that stuff. We've talked about that going through Daniel quite a bit. And they will fall by the edge of the sword and be led away captive into all nations. And Jerusalem will be trampled by Gentiles until the times of Gentiles are fulfilled. And there will be signs in the sun, in the moon, and in the stars. And on the earth, distress of nations with perplexity, the sea and the waves roaring. Men's hearts failing them for fear. And the, and the expectation of those things which are coming on the earth. For the powers of the heavens will be shaken. Then they will, li- then they will see the Son of Man coming in a cloud with power and great glory. And when these things begin to happen, look up and lift your heads because your redemption draws near. Amen. Heavenly Father, we do want to look up tonight, Lord, and and just be looking forward to and hastening that time that you will come. We hope, Lord, that you would just give us a a greater understanding of these subjects tonight, Lord, and that you would help us to see them not in a fearful way, but in a a way of, of looking forward to that time that you will redeem, that you will set things right that you will make restitution and and restoration in this world, Lord, and set up your kingdom, a kingdom of righteousness and a kingdom of justice and a kingdom of great mercy and grace. 
We thank you for that time, Lord. We're looking forward to that time that we can spend with you. And we ask, Lord, that you would just uh, uh, open our hearts tonight, Lord, to reveal whatever it is your spirit desires to teach us tonight. We thank you in Jesus' name. Amen. All right. Well, Signs and Seasons is what I've entitled the message tonight. And there are a couple of reasons for that. You know, as we look at this Olivet Discourse, this whole thing started because the disciples were with Jesus and they were going into the temple area right around the end of of the life of Jesus, the end of the ministry, uh, really the last portion of his ministry. They went into Jerusalem there and, uh, of course, the disciples were looking at this great temple, you know, the temple that Herod had built in this wonderful temple complex and they were just really in awe of, of this temple. And Jesus said, you know, not one stone of this temple is going to be left on top of another. This, this temple is going to be leveled, is what Jesus was saying. Not one stone is going to be left upon another. And, of course, in the minds of the disciples, they were thinking that, hey, we're with the Messiah here. This is the Christ. This is the anointed one. This is the Savior of Jerusalem, the Savior of Israel that we've been waiting for for all these hundreds of years. He's the prophesied one. We know he's going to set up his kingdom now. And uh, when's that going to happen? When is that going to happen? Jesus, when are you going to set up your kingdom that's going to last forever as it's foretold in the Bible? When are you going to do that? And he tells them this. He just lays this bombshell on them. This temple is going to be wiped out. This whole place is going to be leveled. And so in their minds, they're thinking, what in the world are you talking about? And so they begin to ask him, uh, Matthew 24, 23 there, tell us when will these things be and what will be the sign of your coming and of the end of the age? If you're not going to set up your kingdom now, if all these things that we've been thinking are wrong and this temple is going to be destroyed... When is all this going to happen? I mean, it's a very logical thing that they're asking him. When is this going to happen? What are the signs going to be when you will come and when you will set up your temple? And those those things that we've been waiting for, when is all that stuff going to happen if it's not going to happen right now? And so it's a good question that the disciples are asking. It's a question that we're asking still today. When is Jesus going to come back? When is he going to come and and set up that kingdom? And of course, uh, as you go through Matthew 24 there, uh, and as you go through Matthew or Luke 21 here, you know there are many things. If you look at verse nine, it says, you know, Jesus tells them, when you hear, very important, when you hear of wars and commotions, and Matthew 24 says wars and rumors of wars. When you start hearing of wars and rumors of wars. Uh, commotions. Do not be terrified, for these things must come to pass first, but the end will not come immediately. And he said to them, Nation will rise against nation, and kingdom up against kingdom. And there will be great earthquakes in various places, and famines and pestilence. And there will be fearful sights and great signs from heaven. But before all these things, they will lay hands on you and persecute you. And he goes on to talk about that idea of, of people being sold and and persecuted and your own family members turning you in and and uh, the government coming against you and all those sorts of things. But as he lays out these things, wars and rumors of wars and earthquakes and famines and all these things, you know, these are the things that we usually talk about when we're doing a prophecy op- update. Okay, are there earthquakes becoming in more frequencies and becoming more intense and all those kind of things? And there are arguments to say that that is absolutely true, that that there are more earthquakes now than there ever have been and they're more intense. And But, you know, the other argument to that side is, well, they've only been tracking earthquakes with the kind of equipment that we have now for such a time. And so there just isn't that big of a, 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 a data base to go off of. And so there are arguments in both directions. But really what Jesus was saying, hey, these things are going to happen. These things are going to happen. Uh, but you're going to be persecuted. And there's going to be a lot of things leading up until the time that uh, the Lord comes back. And so don't be afraid. When you hear these things, don't be afraid is, is kind of what he's saying there. You need to just not be deceived. 
you need to understand that you're going to be persecuted and that you need to fight for your faith and that you need to hang on to your faith throughout all of these trials and the tribulations that you're going to go through. And so that's something that he wanted to ground them with. But one of the things there, he says, there are going to be fearful sights and great signs from heaven. And so Jesus says in Matthew 24, 42, Watch therefore, for you do not know what hour your Lord is coming. And so he tells you and I to be watching and to be looking. And of course, Christians were made fun of. Uh, if you go on the internet and look up Bible prophecy uh, for any length of time, you know, there's some craziness out there. And of course, uh, you know, we're made fun of because we're always looking for these signs. What are the signs of him coming back? And, and sometimes we, we go over the line and, and try to make up signs. It seems like some Christians, in a, in a desperation to prove that the Bible is true, we, we stretch things out there and, and we try to make things fit. And, of course, here on the earth, you know, with mankind and the governments being set up and taken down and, and all these kind of things, we're always pointing, oh, look, Russia, they're the Antichrist, or, you know, the Pope, he's the Antichrist. And, and we're always looking for these signs. But, you know, the signs that we see in the heavens, the great signs that we see in the, in the sky, the sun and the moon and the stars, those are really outside of any kind of control of mankind. And, uh, and so I think that when we look at Bible prophecy, uh, those signs really are, are monumental. If, if things start happening in the sun and the moon and the stars and, and we start seeing those kind of things and hearing about those kind of things, those are things that we can't manipulate. Mankind, governments, people here on this earth, we can't manipulate that stuff. Uh, if it's happening... It tells us that, man, there's something going on here that lines up exactly with what the Bible teaches us. And so those are the kind of things I want to talk about tonight. Those great signs in the heavens. What's going on and what we can see now. And what one thing that I want to bring across right away is that we are living in a generation that like no other generation that has ever lived before, we can look out into outer space to such a distance that no one has ever come close to and we can see those signs in the heavens like no one has ever seen before and just in the last 10 20 years or so we've seen some amazing signs amazing things going on way out there in outer space that mankind has never seen before things that are going on with our own sun and our own moon that no one has ever seen before and it truly is an amazing time that we live in and so when we look at these verses here I think that, you know, as we start off here, it's an, it's an amazing thing to me as we're watching the signs. What do we find? Here we are, uh, New Year's Eve almost, 2011 approaching, and uh, what's going on in the world that would jump right out at you and tell you that the Lord's coming back soon? And almost every year, almost every month, it seems, another issue is going on with the nation of Israel. And true to form, you know, Jesus said, man, this is, this is the crux of the matter here, is this nation of Israel. And so before we get into the signs, you know, there, there is always something going on with the nation of Israel. And so, you know, we can get tripped up a lot of times when we just look at one particular area of prophecy and say, well, the Lord's coming back because of this. But man, we've got to look at the whole spectrum. And really, I, I just believe that you have to understand there's a convergence of all these signs that's coming down to one point. And that is where Bible prophecy becomes undeniable. It's when you see all of the things that the Bible says all kind of converging down to one single point. And we find that the nation of Israel being back in its land again has taken over the city of Jerusalem. But there's still this battle going back and forth with that city of Jerusalem. And just this month, uh, the Palestinians who of course want to take over half of the, you know, some of the land that Israel has and, and they want to take over part of that city of Jerusalem. And of course for the last 40 or 50 years or so, there's been this struggle going on and negotiations and wars and things. And, and so in the last 30 or 40 years, we've tried to negotiate 
All the governments of the, nation, of the world have just tried to, okay, what do the Palestinians want? Let's have a two-state solution here. Palestinians want this much land, the Jews want this much land, and let's try to negotiate between the two here and try to make something happen here. Well, it seems that the Palestinians have said, enough, we're tired of negotiating. We are going to unilaterally just say, we are a state, and we are entitled to the land that belongs to us, and as a sovereign nation, we're going to take it. And that's the position that they're at right now in Jerusalem. All these many years later, it's amazing that Jerusalem is still this focal point of, of all the trouble in the world, really, with the, with the Jews against the nations that hate the Jews in the city of Jerusalem. And so if the Palestinians get their way, if they just say, well, we are a state, we're going to take over what is rightfully ours, of course, I mean, it could spin out of control very, very quickly. Uh, of course, the Jews are not going to let them just take the settlements and take the land that they believe belongs to them, and rightfully so. And so um, as we begin this new year, here we are, right in the middle of this major international struggle that's going on over the, nation, over the uh, city, not just the nation of Israel, but the city of Jerusalem. One thing that we can look at, well, the last year that we've just gone through, more natural disasters have occurred and killed more people than in the last hundred years. And I think that's another thing that is just absolutely undeniable. I mean, think about, and you know, the Haiti earthquake is what caused a great majority of those things. But there have been other issues that have gone on, other very large earthquakes that have happened, killing hundreds of thousands of people. Earthquakes, heat waves, floods, volcanoes, super typhoons, blizzards. And this is coming from FEMA is saying this. Uh, landslides and droughts killed at least a quarter of a million people in 2010, the deadliest year in more than a generation. He goes on there, and uh, the director of, or one of the guys from FEMA says, more people were killed by uh, worldwide by natural disasters this year than have been killed in terrorism attacks in the past 40 years combined. And so, um, again, you have this convergence of things that are happening. Israel still in the news, uh, coming to a head. And now we have these natural disasters happening as well. And again, these, these signs alone don't say that it's getting there, it's, it's getting worse and worse and worse. Standing alone, you know, you can write them off and say, well, you know, that's happened before, 100 years ago, there might have been more natural disasters. But again, it, it's coming all it, it, coming to a head, you might say. When we get back to the signs in the, in the uh, sky, the, uh, the moon, the sun, and the stars. Looking at that, we find almost the first pages in the Bible, the first chapter of the Bible, tells us very, something very significant about the sun and the moon and the part it plays in God communicating with us. Genesis 1.14, Then God said, Let there be lights in the firmament of the heavens to divide the day from the night. That's one purpose. Let them be for signs and seasons and for days and years. And let them be for lights in the firmament of the heavens to give light on the earth. And so a couple of purposes that God designed and, and, and placed the sun and the moon uh, to give us light is, is just a basic function but it's for signs and seasons. And you think, well, signs for, you know, what time of month it is or what time of year it is and seasons and all that kind of thing, and we can understand that. But the Hebrew words that are used here are very specific, very specific, uh, telling us that God is trying to communicate something to us with the words he's using here. Another verse that, uh, well, the one we're looking at tonight, there will be signs in the sun, in the moon, and in the stars and on the earth, distress of nations with perplexity, the sea and the waves roaring, men's hearts failing them from fear and the expectation of those things which are coming on the earth for the powers of heavens will be shaken. There will be signs in the sun, in the moon, and in the stars and on the earth. Signs. 
Well, the, the word, again, that, that the Bible is using here for signs in the, in the Old Testament, as well as in the Greek, the Hebrew word there, off, uh, used in the sense of appearing a signal, literally or figur- figuratively, as a flag or a beacon, a monument, an omen, a prodigy, evidence, a mark, a miracle, a sign, something along those lines. It's, it's not, uh, uh, not just signifying what time of year it is or what time of month it is. It's a very specific thing that God is trying to communicate to us. The word seasons, also an appointment, a fixed time or season, specifically a festival. And so when we talk about the, the festivals or the feasts that the Jews kept, back, you know, remember as we got, went through uh, Exodus and Leviticus, the Passover feast, the Fe- Feast of Tabernacles, the Feast of Trumpets, all those feasts that we've talked about in great detail. These are very specific feasts that God wants to accomplish a, a specific task or to remember a specific time, a time of redemption with the, the Passover feast. Remember those. Uh, if you haven't, you know, I encourage you to read through or, or get the tapes. I, I don't have time to go into it tonight, but these festivals were at a very specific time of the year. And so, of course, thousands of years ago, they didn't have day planners and they didn't have little, uh, you know, laptops and watches and all that kind of stuff. Uh, and, and so, you know, they, they were watching the moon, they were watching the sun, and God set the sun and the moon in such a way that you can tell time by it. God designed the heavens and the earth, you know. Of course, if you just believe that the whole thing exploded into existence and there's no rhyme or reason to it, you know, this doesn't make a whole lot of sense to you. But if we believe what the Bible says, that God designed it, He set the sun and the moon in such a way that it circles the earth in such a way that it can tell time and and that that exhibits a, a bit of design don't you think there's some design going on here and so God has set this whole system up to help us tell time to help the Jews in particular know hey it's the time of the year that you need to come and celebrate this feast again it's the time of the year to now go into this part of of your worship of me, for you to come to Jerusalem again and offer that lamb and and all these things that we've talked about. Their signs and their seasons. That's why the sun and the moon was set in place, not just to give us light upon the earth. And so it's interesting as you look through the Bible, there are many passages of scripture that deal with prophetic signs in the sun and the moon that tell us what time it is in relationship to God's wrath falling upon the earth and the return of Jesus Christ. And we can be looking at those. You remember that uh, Peter, when the Holy Spirit fell on the early church there, uh, and they began to speak in tongues and, and began to extol the wonders of God and how great God was, and all the people around them were saying, hey, what's going on here? These guys are drunk. What, what is, why, are they, why do I hear them talking in my language and, and professing the greatness of God and the wonders of God? Why, why do I hear this? What's going on here? How can they speak in my language? These are just a bunch of fishermen. And so Peter came out, you remember, and he said, this is what was spoken by the prophet Joel. This is Acts chapter 2, verse 16. And it shall come to pass, now he's quoting from Joel, In the last days, says God, that I will pour out of my spirit on all flesh. Your sons and your daughters shall prophesy. And so we understand that passage to be a direct implication of the church, the birth of the church, if you will, as the Holy Spirit is poured out, a confirmation of the birth of the church, I guess you might want to say, that the church is now here and it is now the church age. Peter is taking that by the Holy Spirit and saying this applies to the time that we're living in. The last days. The last days that that man will exist on the earth in the current setup that we're in. This is the last days. And so Peter says this passage applies to what's going on. What you're hearing right now is an outpouring of God's Spirit. And we know that passage very well because we like to talk about being filled with the Holy Spirit and be baptized with the Holy Spirit and all that kind of stuff. We, we know that passage. But Peter said some other things as he's continuing to quote from Joel there uh, that we don't know as well. 
And we kind of discount it and think, oh, that's just kind of figurative speech and that's interesting. But what does Peter go on to say there? He goes on and keeps on quoting from Joel. And I'm just going to quote the Joel chapter here. Joel 2, 30 through 31. And I will show wonders in the heavens and in the earth, blood and fire and pillars of smoke. The sun shall be turned into darkness and the moon into blood before the coming of the great and awesome day of the Lord. Before the Lord comes back in this time that we're dealing with right here, in the time of the church age, in the last days, the Lord is going to pour out His Spirit, but He's also going to give us signs in the heavens, wonders in the heavens. Uh, Specifically, the moon turned to blood. The moon turned to blood. Now, most Bible scholars believe that the moon being turned to blood is, is a reference to a lunar eclipse in which you see, when you see a total lunar eclipse, the, the moon takes on a very red, crimson uh, look to it. And it's an amazing thing. We just had one the other day, and that's kind of what uh, spurred me to, to look into this a little more and do some research and, and bring a message uh, based on this, is, is the lunar eclipse that we had just last week. And so the moon turned to blood. Well, again, you know, this is talked about on on numerous occasions as you go through the prophetic scriptures uh, dealing with the tribulation period. Of course, it's talked about on a couple of occasions. Got some cool artwork in there to keep you entertained while I'm rambling on here. So Matthew 24, again, this Mount Olivet Discord. uh, Immediately after the tribulation of those days, the sun will be darkened and the moon will not give its light. The stars will fall from heaven and the powers of the heavens will be shaken. The powers of the heavens will be shaken. The stars are going to fall from the heaven. The sign of the Son of Man will, then the sign of the Son of Man will appear in heaven and then all the tribes of the earth will mourn and they will see the Son of Man coming on the clouds of heaven with power and great glory. And so, again, we see in the tribulation period, before the return of Christ, before that, after that, that really harsh, great tribulation period of persecution and God's wrath being poured out, there are going to be these signs in the heavens right before Jesus comes back. Now, this is not talking about the rapture. I'm not talking about the rapture at all. And so you might say, well, why are we even discussing this? This is happening during the tribulation. It doesn't really affect the believers. Well, again, the verses that we looked at in verse 26 of the passage that we're looking at on the earth, and they will see in verse 27, the Son of Man coming uh, in a cloud with power and great glory. Now, when you see these things begin to happen, look up and lift your heads because your redemption draws near. And so, again, uh, are there some things that are going to happen prior to the rapture of the church, prior to that tribulation period? that we can start looking at, that are happening now, perhaps, that are coming. Well, again, that lunar eclipse, when the, when the sun tur- or when the moon turns that red color, it has to be a total eclipse, as you see the moon here, with the earth in direct line with the sun and the moon. Uh, and so at a certain period, as it's going through this total eclipse, you'll get that very red look that, that the moon will exhibit. And so it's, it's not a tremendously rare thing for a, a blood red moon, as it's called sometimes. It's, it's not that uncommon to have a red moon. And you say, what's the big deal? I've seen them a bunch of times. Well, only seven back-to-back uh, blood red moons have fallen on the first day of Passover and Tabernacles since the first century. Scientists call this a tetrad when you have four total lunar eclipses happening in a two-year period. It's the most rare of all of the lunar eclipses. Only seven times since the first century AD has that happened where those lunar eclipses have happened two years in a row on Passover and on the Feast of Tabernacles. It's extremely rare. It, it happens every 600 years that those blood red moons happen in a two-year period, four of them in that two-year period. Passover 
2014, Feast of Tabernacles 2014, Passover 2015, and then Tabernacles on 2015 will be the eighth time that this will happen uh, since the first century. And again, you think, well, what, what's the big deal? What's the big deal? Well, because it's so rare that you have four of them in that two-year period, it's even more rare that it would happen as God has set this whole thing up that it would happen right on his feast days. Of course, Passover being one of the more incredible times for this sort of thing to go on. And if you think of it just in that context, it's like, well, that's interesting. Uh, that's, that's kind of interesting. And that's what I thought. As somebody told me about this like a year ago, and I watched a video and I thought, hmm, that's interesting. Might be trying to make that fit. But then there's one other item of information that I was given just recently that just kind of blew my mind. Some of the other three times that this has happened uh, in the last century, 1949 and 1950, 1967, and 1968. Now, what happened in 1948? Israel became a nation again, right? The first Passover after Israel becomes a nation On that Passover, there's a blood red moon. The first Feast of Tabernacles after Israel becomes a nation again, there's a blood red moon. The following year on Passover, another blood red moon. The following uh, year on Tabernacles, there's a blood red moon. That's pretty incredible to me. Uh, and, And I do find that very interesting. Now, they became a nation in 48... 48 they became a nation 49 is when they actually set up their government and so the the actual government you know they they kind of went in and proclaimed themselves we're a nation again but they really didn't start governing themselves as a nation until 49 and 50 Uh, and so that first Passover happened and they have this blood red moon the four in a row pretty incredible and then you add on to that the same thing happened 20 years later in 1967 when Israel had their six day war and took over the city of Jerusalem and made the city of Jerusalem their uh, their capital city reclaimed once again the city of Jerusalem and then again you have on Passover blood red moon and tabernacles blood red moon and so all I'm saying is it's rare it's extremely rare and again the Lord set this up. And so for it to all happen on those days, it's really quite incredible. Now, we don't want to base anything on that, but again, we have uh, 2014, 2015 coming up. We have this going to happen again in addition to those two years. And this has never happened before. In addition to that happening on Passover and on uh, Passover and Sukkot is, is Tabernacles. Uh, we're going to have, in those two years, two solar eclipses on God's holy days as well. Uh, on the new year, Nisan 1, we're going to have a solar eclipse. And then on the Feast of Trumpets, we're also going to have uh, uh, another one on the year 2015. So again, these are not smoking gun kind of, well, that's it. You know, the Lord's coming back 2014. And, and so I have no idea what's going to happen, if anything's going to happen. All I'm saying is it's very rare. When God says, look at the signs in the heavens, look at what's going on with the sun and the moon, and, and you know, we're not supposed to be pagan astrologers here and, and be tracking the, the zodiac and all that kind of stuff. But again, uh, you see a verse here in Jeremiah. Thus says the Lord, learn not the way of the heathen and be not dismayed at the signs of heaven for the heathen are dismayed at them. And, and so we don't want to run headlong into tracking this stuff and, and being afraid of this kind of thing as the heathen do, as they track the zodiac and, and all that kind of stuff. We've got to be very careful about this kind of stuff and not set dates. But it is very interesting that these things are going on. And so again, these are just signs that you can kind of look at and say, that's interesting. That's interesting. Revelation 6.12, I looked... When he opened the sixth seal, and behold, there was a great earthquake, and the sun became black as sackcloth of hair, and the moon 
became like blood. And so, again, another verse that talks about those things happening during the tribulation period. I like what this commentator says about this whole idea of these moons at the time that they're happening, the frequency that they're happening, and the fact that they're happening right now. Go back in time to 1492 or whenever that Spanish Inquisition thing was going on. Have the four blood red moons. Doesn't mean anything. Why? Israel not back in their land. None of the other things are happening that lead us to believe that the Lord's coming back soon. Uh, You know, I mean, you could put some things in there, but there's nowhere near the convergence that we're having of all the prophetic signs right now. And so... uh, the time that we're in right now. This phenomenon is not so remarkable. Jewish calendar is a lunar-based calendar. But let's not forget that the Creator planned it that way for His purposes, which makes this kind of sign all the more worthy of note. And again, that's all it is. It's just a note. Note one more thing in your mind that you can say, hmm, man, there's, there's a lot of indicators out there that the Lord is coming back soon. Another one that I want to look at with you here tonight, uh, dealing with this idea of of blood red moons and all that sort of thing. Uh, March 23rd, 1997, on the Feast of Purim. uh, We've been talking about that in Esther as we've been going through Esther. Another blood red moon or sackcloth moon appeared over Jerusalem at the time that the Halebop Comet was going by. And again, that on its own is, is not that big of a deal. Not that big of a deal at all. However, when they discover the hale Comet, and this is kind of what I want to get at with, with some of the information I'm putting out here tonight. When they discover that hale Comet, we have the technology now to where they can go back and realize, okay, what kind of circuit is this comet made, making? I mean, the, two amateur astron- astronomers discovered this comet. And... And it wasn't very far away at the time that they discovered it. And now all of a sudden we realize this thing is, is, is coming into our solar system. It has a, an orbit inside of our solar system. And they're able to, you know, triangulate, you know, the, the direction of this thing and, and how long the ellipse of this comet is. And so they can go back in time and figure out when's the last time this thing came through. When do you think... The last time the Hellbop Comet came through the Earth uh, or came around the Earth to where we could see it inside of our uh, solar system was. Anybody know? Last time. According to the Smithsonian, the same year Noah received his orders to build the Ark. Interesting. A judgment's going to come upon the Earth. The biggest judgment that has ever happened up until that point and up until this point today where God sends a flood that destroys the entire earth. The year that Noah received that order to build that ark, this comet flies through the sky. It's an interesting thing. The next time it comes around, it's on the feast day of Purim, uh, and you have this blood red moon. Again, all those things are, are not too amazing on their own. But now we have another comet that's kind of around coming through our our system. And we're starting to realize now that our technology is growing, we've discovered there are about 2,000 comets that are kind of coming inside and outside of our solar system and and they're they're spinning around all over the place out there, 2,000 of them. And we've sent out spacecraft to find out more information about these things. What are they made out of? If one of them hits the Earth, what is it going to do to the Earth based on its composition and what it's made out of? And it's so interesting, as this uh, Comet Hartley, you guys might have heard of this uh, in the news just recently, Comet Hartley 2, as it's called. Uh, We've had a spacecraft chasing this thing for about 23 million miles, finally caught it back in November, and got within about 400 miles of this thing and started taking pictures of it and trying to figure out what's going on with it and getting up close enough to to take in the off gases of the comet to try to figure out what the composition of the comet is. And interesting, when they, when they got in close to this thing, of course they believed that uh, comets had a certain mixture of, of dust and rock and, and uh, ice, mainly made of ice though. But what they found is very interesting. 
The abundance of um, cyanide, that's CN, in the comet's atmosphere jumped by a factor of five over an eight-day period in September. And, and NASA is saying, that's huge. Cyanide. Curiously, however, there was no corresponding increase in dust. And so they were expecting to see a lot of dust. As our spacecraft was getting closer and closer to it, they thought the amount of dust would get more and more and more. But what they found was cyanide was becoming more uh, uh, thicker in the, in the off gases. This flies in the face of conventional wisdom. Comet cores are thought to be a mishmash of volatile ices, rock, and dust particles generally well mixed. When the ice evaporates to produce a jet of gas, dust naturally uh, comes along for the ride. Yet this outburst was pure cyanide gas. Pure cyanide gas comes blasting out of this thing. And so that is what they're believing now about these comets, is they're made of, you know, essentially cyanide gas uh, at the core, and they're off-gassing this stuff. Well, that's very interesting in the light of what's said in Revelation. And I want you to turn there for just a minute. Revelation chapter 8. Again, the events that we're going to talk about here are happening within that tribulation period. In verse 7 of Revelation chapter 8, we're going to deal with uh, some judgments here. And it says there in verse 7, The first angel sounded, and hail and fire followed, mingled with blood, and they were thrown to the earth. And a third of the trees were burned up, and all green grass was burned up. Then the second angel sounded, and something like a great mountain burning with fire was thrown into the sea, and a third of the sea became blood. And a third of the living creatures in the sea died, and a third of ships were destroyed. Then the third angel sounded, and a great star fell from heaven, burning like a torch, and it fell on a third of the rivers, and on the, on the springs of water, the name of the star is Wormwood. A third of the waters became Wormwood. And many men died from the water because it was made bitter. And a fourth angel sounded, a third of the sun was struck, a third of the moon and a third of the stars, so that they, a third of them were darkened and a third of the day did not shine. And likewise the night, it goes on there. But one of the things that I wanted to just kind of highlight here this star, this great star that fell from heaven in verse 9, burning like a torch, could very well be a comet, uh, and it could well, very well be uh, what causes this bitterness, the waters to become bitter. If comets are truly made of cyanide gas, can you imagine? Uh, we have 2,000 of these comets circling around in our solar system right now. Probably more than that. These are just 2,000 that we found. And so if one of these things happens to hit the earth or the atmosphere of the earth and explodes, I mean, uh, some of these things are a hundred miles wide, just gigantic, huge balls of cyanide gas. I mean, can you imagine if those, one of these things lands in the ocean, lands on a, a large lake or a large freshwater uh, source upon the earth? I mean, uh, catastrophic. And the reason I wanted to bring it out tonight is because, again, we have the technology to understand that what we're understanding here in this passage is completely logical. It could happen. It's not uh, mythological. It's not just uh, poetic things that are going on here. The, the further we go in time, the longer we're here on this earth, the more advanced we become with our sciences and, and our understanding of the way the world works and the way the stars and the moon and everything works, the more we understand that this is absolutely plausible. And not only plausible, we will see it before it comes. And that is what I wanted to point out as we look at, go ahead and turn back over to, to Luke. The main point I'm wanting to bring to you guys tonight here is that in verse 
25 there, there will be signs in the sun and the moon and the stars and the earth. Distress or perplexity is what the old King James says. Perplexity, distress, just a feeling that there's no way out of this. We know that this is going to happen and there's no way that we can get out of it. It's kind of the idea, a distress, a perplexity of nations with perplexity, the sea and the waves roaring, men's hearts failing them from fear and the expectation of those things which are coming on the earth for the powers of the heavens will be shaken. We have the technology right now to pinpoint a comet 23 million miles out into outer space, send an, a spacecraft to that comet and figure out what that comet is made out of. You know, figure out the trajectories and the, the math that goes into that kind of thing is just incredible. Slingshotting a, a rocket past the moon and the earth and the gravities and all that kind of stuff to, to intersect those two things 23 million miles out into space. We have that kind of technology now. And we can project that out there and look out there and see this thing is going to hit the earth and there's nothing we can do about it. And I think that's exactly what's being said here. Men's hearts will fail from fear, from the expectation of the things that are coming to the earth. And what do you think that's going to do to people's hearts? Do you think they're going to turn to the Lord maybe? When they realize two years from now, a year from now, however long. I mean, hell, Bob, two amateur scientists found this thing. Oh man, this thing's in our solar system. It's going to come within so many miles of the earth. And they figured that out. Hey, it's going to be, I think it was 93 million miles from the earth, but we could still see it screaming across the sky. Think about the fear that's involved when they say this thing is coming right at the earth. It's going to hit the earth and there's nothing we can do about it. Think about that kind of fear as you're just watching this thing coming in. That's what the Bible says is going to happen. That's what Revelation says is going to happen. There's going to be a great star, a mountain burning like a torch headed for the earth and there's nothing you can do about it and men's hearts will be failing from fear because of that expectation. It's coming, and there's nothing we can do about it. Only in this generation can we understand that kind of thing. Only the generation that you and I are living in right now can we come to grips with that. They could never... I mean, if if a comet was going to hit a thousand years ago, 500 years ago, you wouldn't know until it just kind of hit the earth. I mean, you might see it, but... Is that going to hit us? I don't know. It's out there. It's a star. What's going on with that? I mean, you just wouldn't really know. Things like the hale Bob Comet, it was just, it was just a, an omen to them. You know, It didn't mean a whole lot. It was a scary thing. There was a lot of superstition involved with it. But there's no superstition involved with what we're talking about here. God has set these things up. And he said, this is going to happen. And these are going to be the signs that are going to take place in outer space that I have set up from the beginning of the entire universe and you need to watch for them and you need to understand them and only in the generation that we live in can we come to grips with that and understand the implications of that and that is what I think is is really one of the signs of the times that we can project back in time 6,000 years of lunar eclipses That's where this guy got the information about the blood red moons. NASA has a website that they can project back in time every lunar eclipse that has happened since man has been on the earth. And that goes for the stars and and the comets and everything else. There are programs out there now that you can download for free that you can go back as many years as you want to and find out, you know, what was Halley's Comet doing 6,000 years ago. You know, where was it? At what point in the sky was it? And you can zoom into that point in the sky and, and see a, uh, a, a computer model of the trajectory of the planets, 
going back as far back as you want to go and as far forward as you want to go. Only in our generation. My daughter has a cell phone that she can aim up into the sky at any point in the sky and it'll show her all the stars that are in that quadrant, all the constellations, and, and she can just look at the whole sky. That's amazing technology. It's amazing technology and it allows us to see some of the things that are going on in, in Revelation and, and these signs of the times that, that no other generation could even begin to understand. It was all just superstition and, oh, the gods are mad at us and they're throwing fire at us and, and all that kind of stuff. This is not pagan superstition. This is God saying, there are signs out there that I want you to watch, I want you to pay attention to, because they're signs of my return. They're signs of the wrath that is going to come on the earth. Men's hearts failing for fear. Well, again, I don't want to be a fear monger here tonight, but again, there's another sign that we can look at with the, moon, with the uh, sun. The sun is waking up, NASA says, from a deep slumber. And in the next few years, we'll expect to see much higher levels of solar activity, said Richard Fisher, head of NASA's heliophysics division, and that's the science of the interaction between the, the sun and our Earth and the things that are going on. And so you see some flares coming off the sun there. Now again, the, the sun has cycles. It goes in cycles. And sometimes it's very active and sometimes it's not very active. Uh, we've gone through a period where it's not been very active and now all of a sudden it's becoming active once again. And they're saying that this year is going to be uh, the beginning of a very active period of time for the sun. Astronomers say that the solar flare of uh, Tuesday, November 4th, 2003 was by far the biggest ever observed. Huge solar flare coming off the sun. Gigantic. Now, it's only the only, it's just the one that has been observed, the largest one that's ever been observed. And again, we go back to that area of scripture where Jesus is talking about when you hear about these things. When you see these things happen, you know, it, it's these things might have been bigger in the past, we don't know, but men's hearts will begin to fail because the more our technology tells us about the solar flares and seeing the things that are going to happen, we're going to know about it more. And there's a fear factor that comes as a result of that. Now, if the largest one was in 2003 and we're going into a time of more activity, uh, there's a possibility that it might get worse. We don't know that for sure. But here's what they're afraid of. The way our technology is today, we are so dependent on electronics, they're, they're very fearful that a large solar flare could wipe out an entire grid of electricity. It could be like an EMP pulse. And you've probably heard about that, where if a nuclear bomb goes off in the atmosphere at a certain altitude, a nuclear device of some sort, it can basically fry all electronics within a, in a certain area of that bomb going off. And so these solar flares have kind of the same effect where it can just fry large grids of electricity and electronics. And because we are so dependent upon those things, you know, our, our, we could return to uh, a very, you know, go back a hundred years in time very quickly because we're so heavily dependent on computers, so our, you know, everything, the water systems, the electrical systems, the, the communications networks, everything is so dependent upon them. And so the fear is that these, these solar flares could you know, just really take us back 100 years in time, just like that. One flare could just destroy our economies and cause vast amounts of, of problems in the world and, and basically be like a Hurricane Katrina or another natural disaster that would just cripple us, costing millions and even trillions of dollars to repair, which would destroy our economies. Uh, one of the guys uh, being quoted here from, I, I think it's NASA, he says, I believe we're on the threshold of a new era in which space weather can be as influential as our daily life, in our daily lives as ordinary, uh, ordinary terrestrial weather, Fisher said. Uh, we take this very seriously indeed. He goes on there and it says, uh, 
This is actually a different guy. Solar storms power to threaten modern inf infrastructure is real and it's on its way, according to Yusuf But I'm not making fun of the guy. It's his name. He's an astrophysicist. Don't make fun of him. A physicist in the High Energy Astroph uh, Astrophysics Division at Harvard, Smithsonian. And so uh, it's, very, it's a very real thing that they're looking at here. He says, it is virtually guaranteed that a powerful geomagnetic storm capable of knocking out a significant section of the U.S. electrical grid will occur within the next few decades. Guaranteed. Guaranteed. Uh, in fact, this may well happen even within the next few years as we approach the next period of the elevated solar activity, which is forecast to peak in 2013. Uh, but it's another article says it's beginning in 2011, peaking in 2013. So it, it's not fear mongering. These are just signs that are going on in the sun, in the moon, uh, standing alone 100 years ago, 300 years ago, however long ago. They don't make much of a difference. But in the time we live in, these are signs that we cannot ignore. These are signs that we can't just discount because God says, look at the sun, look at the moon. Look at the stars and understand that I'm trying to communicate some things to you. Revelation 16, 3, and we're almost done here. We see some other judgments that are being met out here during that tribulation period. Sixteen, oh, three, I was on 13. We have the, the bowls of God's wrath being poured out here. And in, in verse 3 it says, The second angel poured out his bowl on the sea, and it became blood as of a dead man. And every living creature in the sea died. Then the third angel poured out his bowl on the rivers and springs of water, and they became blood. And I heard the angel of the waters saying, you are righteous, O Lord, the one who is and who, it, who was and who is to be, because you have judged these things. For they have shed the blood of the saints and prophets, and you have given them blood to drink, for it is their just due. But then as he goes on there in verse 7, And I heard another from the altar saying, Even so, Lord God Almighty, true and righteous are your judgments. Then the fourth angel poured out of his bowl on the sun and power was given to him to scorch men with fire. And men were scorched with great heat and they blasphemed the name of God who has power over these plagues and they did not repent and give him glory. And then you have another bowl judgment being poured out after that. Many people look at the global warming I'm not going to tell you my own personal feelings about the global warming thing, but they look at the global warming idea as fulfilling prophecy and saying, well, you know, the earth is going to keep on heating up because of global warming. And that, you know, that's a fulfillment of prophecy. But, you know, I think it's very clear here that the judgment is, is being poured out a bowl on the sun itself and power was given to scorch men with fire. And I think that, you know, the solar flares are, are really what's being discussed here as the activity of the sun is going to become more and more volatile. And, uh, and these solar flares can shoot out really millions of miles. And, and if, we, if we have large enough ones, they can really just cause a, a radiation burn that would just uh, be awful and just fry large portions of the earth. It's a very frightening thing if you think about it. I don't know what's more frightening than the power of the sun and, and that becoming more volatile than it already is. I mean, you look at pictures of the sun and videos of the sun, what they can take of it, and just the power that is involved there and then it becoming unstable. I mean, that's, that's a frightening thing. That is a very frightening thing. And, um, and so these are, again, these are signs that we can be looking at 
I'm not saying these things are, are happening now. My, my main point is that we have the technology to understand that these things could be getting worse. Well, that's it for tonight. Uh, I, I do want to refer back again um, one last time to the verses that we see in Luke. If you could turn back there just for a second. In the last verse that we cover there, verse 27 says, Then they will see the Son of Man coming in a cloud with power and great glory. Now when these things begin to happen, look up and lift your heads because your redemption draws near. And that is really how I like to end every prophecy uh, talk that I give. You know, all of these things are designed to, to bring mankind to a place of acknowledging who God is, that He is real, that He's a loving God, that He's a caring God, and He wants to have a relationship with us. But that He's only giving, you know, the earth a, a certain amount of time, a space to repent, is spoken of in the Word. Uh, and then, you know, it's kind of the end of God's plan of redemption. Those who refuse to repent, those who refuse, even after these things, after a wormwood type, and I don't know how many years, or, you know, maybe there isn't going to be any kind of heads up or any kind of um, advance notice of a star like wormwood coming in to crash into the earth. Maybe they won't know. But something like that has got to bring people to repent. And what we see within the book of Revelation is all these things are happening. All these judgments and wrath and and, uh, bowls of wrath are being poured out upon the earth. And still there are groups of people who still refuse to repent. Well, when we as, as believers in Jesus Christ start seeing these things and start understanding that these things are possible in the time that we live in, God says, begin to look up. Begin to look up your time of redemption, that time that that God will come for his own and, and, and bring us out of this mess is very soon. It's coming. And as a result of that, he doesn't stop there. He says in verse 34, take heed to yourselves, lest your hearts be weighed down with carousing, drunkenness and cares of this life. And that day come upon you unexpectedly, for it will come as a snare on all of those who dwell on the face of the whole earth. Watch therefore and pray always that you may be counted worthy to escape all those things, all these things, and that will come to pass, uh, that will come to pass, and to stand before the Son of Man, that you will be counted worthy to escape. And when we talk about the rapture. That's exactly what Jesus is talking about. You know, Jesus didn't really ever come out and and clearly say anything about the rapture. And uh, that's led a lot of people to say, well, maybe the rapture's not going to happen. Because Jesus really never went into great detail about the rapture, so why should we believe it's going to happen? Well, Jesus says right here that you may be counted worthy. Pray always. Watch therefore and pray always that you may be counted worthy to escape all these things. All these things, the tribulation is what Jesus is talking about. You want to be counted worthy to escape all those things. And that escape comes in the form of the rapture of the church for those believers who right now are looking up and saying, Lord Jesus, come quickly. I believe in you. Uh, I love you. I accept what you've done for me. I can't wait to spend eternity with you. I'm going to keep working down here on this earth and doing what you've asked me to do until you call us home. But man, come and get us. Get us out of here. I want to be counted worthy to escape these things that are going to come upon the earth. Don't you? Amen. Well, let's stand and worship the Lord. Father, we thank you, Lord, for the insights that you give us in your word, Lord, the truth that you bring to us in your word. Lord, we ask that we would not be fearful, that we would not get tripped up and and start tracking star charts and astrological charts and those kind of things and get off off the, the beaten path of where you want us, but 
Father, that these things would just bring us into a deeper relationship with you, into a deeper love and respect of you and, and, uh, and a more abiding relationship with you. Lord, we ask that you would help us to um, just be able to, uh, in this coming year, not be fixated upon fear and, and apocalyptic visions, but Lord, upon the task that you have given us to go out and make disciples of all men, to go out and spread the gospel to the Jerusalem that we are living in here in Eureka and to the rest of the world. Lord, help us to be diligent about that task. Help us, Lord, to remember these things that we've heard tonight as a motivation, Lord, that you are coming back soon and that we need to redeem the time because the days are truly evil. We thank you for these things, Lord. We praise you for them. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.